and welcome to Fair Observer Exclusive. I'm Glenn Carl. I'm Atul Singh. Today at FO Exclusive, we'll examine two instead of three topics. The first is the new emerging world order. The second is the global banking turmoil. And Glenn will take you through the first one. Off you go, Glenn. Thanks. Uh, it's, I think, one of the most exciting, and, and I don't say that in a I'm thrilled and joy um, perspective, but one of the most consequential, a word that I apparently use uh, to make a point, um, <clears throat> and um, historic uh, moments that any of us have lived in, certainly since 1945. <clears throat> we can call it the new emerging world order because it's dynamic, I guess, although I think uh, what I'll talk about and what we are now living in is um, almost uh, formed uh, fully or it's it there are many contingent steps ahead uh, but uh, we really do live in a new world what am i talking about <clears throat> pardon me well all of us have lived since 1945 there are some of us who were alive before then but but not too many now um <clears throat> in um first the cold war bipolar uh, system with um a theoretically non-aligned uh, what we now call the global south and then there was the unipolar moment that um is uh, past has pretty much passed from uh from the world uh, where during which the united states was were truly the only global hegemon now however uh, we are um quickly not just emerging we're, we're now living in a, a bipolar system uh with uh, a far more uh po series of powerful independent actors from what we call the global south which i think is a sort of a, a woke kind of euphemism to talk about <laughs> countries that simply are not as rich <clears throat> now, although they generally are to the south of uh, the you know, on the globe so there were two clear signals of of truly what is an historic 12 month period uh, of these shifts uh, in the world and to the world order in the last 12 months uh, in march of this year we're still in march uh, we all uh, learned about the uh, chinese brokered saudi uh, iranian um, accord peace agreement uh, also in march uh, Xi Jinping uh, uh, went to to uh, um, uh, kiss the ring of uh, Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Now he, he visited Moscow. Two significant um, trips, far more than the normal international significance to, uh, events. But both of these events are part of a, a dramatic series of changes that can be uh, captured and described uh, well by a couple of other things that occurred in the past 12 months really just 12 months in march of 2022 uh, something that uh, i've written about and we spoke about here but that hasn't really received much attention uh, because of the the venue where this occurred it's the solomon islands uh, which last came to the world's attention in 19 uh, in world war ii uh, when they were strategically important in the war between japan and the united states but the chinese uh, signed a, a security agreement with the government of the Solomons. Uh, I'll talk about why that is significant in a moment. <clears throat> and then a month before that, as we all know, uh, and where all of our attention has been, um, or, uh, in February 2022, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. So these three things, there are many other uh, incidents always, and all analysis is a bit reductionist <clears throat> but i think that the, the february 22 invasion the march 22 um security agreement of china with the solomons the march 23 visit of xi jinping and the march 23 saudi um iranian peace accord brokered by the chinese pretty well have decided or or crystallized shaped um what is now uh, a, a revolutionary uh, new world in which we are all living just just uh, j just very quickly uh, the reason um, the the um, Saudi Iran deal is important and I have a long article on this short article rather on this uh, by my standards at least on fair observer is because 
Um, since 1979, uh, the Saudis and the Iranians have been at loggerheads. In 1979, two things happened. The Iranian Revolution, which basically off, uh, made Iran uh, uh, a sworn enemy of the U.S. Out went the Shah, a lackey of the U.S., who was installed uh, by the CIA in MI6 in 1953. Um, and in came uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, Ruhollah Khomeini. And uh, the world as we know it has changed completely. We now have a theological regime in Iran, the land of plastic surgery and nose jobs, ironically as well. And in 1979, there was the grand siege of Mecca, wherein thousands were killed in in this case, um, the, um, the uprising didn't succeed. The House of Saud continued to rule and indeed continues to rule to this day. But the House of Saud as well pandered to the Wahhabis to make sure that uh, they didn't sort of get thrown under the bus. And the House of Saud funded the jihad in Afghanistan. And so after 79, we've had the millenarian Shia fundamentalism from Iran and you've had the Sunni um, Wahhabi Islam exported all the way from Bosnia to Indonesia. And both have continued the traditional Shia Sunni rivalry that goes back uh, well over a thousand years. So to get these two sworn enemies to sit down uh, across the table and to kiss and make up is a phenomenal achievement. And China is now a player in the Middle East. And not just a player in the Middle East, it is, uh, it, it is now the biggest trading partner of both Saudi, and, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. And so this is extremely significant, or as Glenn says, consequential. Over to you, Glenn. Yes. Well, why is that's the, the why uh, this is worthy of note and uh, discussion is exactly the, um, the point that you, you rightly uh, have focused on. There are several levels that we can uh, look at what happened. So it's at the, the most immediate level, and, and that's, I'm not dismissing that, uh, um, belittling the consequence, the significance of this, uh, is that it, the Chinese have succeeded in uh, brokering uh, at least a momentary peace, certainly a ceasefire, between uh, proxy forces and sometimes direct uh, forces of the Saudis, the Sunnis, and the uh, Iranians, the Shia, in the war, hideous, the, all wars I suppose are hideous, uh, war in Yemen, uh, which uh, the United States has been trying to uh, broker and, and others too, and no one has succeeded. So that's just on its own a real diplomatic success. But as Atul uh, mentioned, China is now a geostrategic player of influence and success, a peacemaker in the Middle East. This is the first time really since uh, 1972, I would argue, that another major uh, power has had significant uh, influence in the entire region of the Middle East. Since the end of World War II, when you know, Britain was uh, bled out, exhausted, and weakened by its uh, its victory um, uh, in World War II, uh, the United States has, in the Middle East, as most everywhere else, been really the cock of the walk. Uh, the I mean, Soviets, the, 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 the uh, Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's deal with uh, uh, King Ibn Saud, uh, he came um, famously to um, to a great um, uh, naval ship that Roosevelt was on, slept in a Bedou tent, and um, and uh, this deal was concluded on Valentine's Day, appropriately, February fourteenth, nineteen forty-five. Roosevelt assured uh, the House of Saud uh, security on the throne, uh, said that well, we'll make sure that no one else gives you the chop. And in return, uh, the Saudis promised oil. And in fact, after the war, and, and the US cut out the UK, Churchill very much wanted that oil deal from Saudi Arabia, but they made a series of faux pas. They sent um, a Rolls Royce, but uh, you know, uh, they, they, they got a lot of things mixed up. Even that was seen as an insult because it was on the wrong side of the road or something to that effect. Anyway, long story short, uh, the the deal held for decades, and indeed uh, the 
oil market is still priced in dollars. Petrodollars helped uh, drive uh, the financial markets right since the oil boom, 70s, 80s, and so on and so forth. So, so uh, the U.S. has had uncontested uh, top dog sta uh, status in this region. But now the U.S. is energy independent. Uh, 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 and so the U.S. doesn't need the region as much. And the biggest importer of Saudi oil is now China. The second biggest importer is India. The, the um, Whatever Churchill's miscues, um, uh, pretty much the problem for the British was that they didn't have enough guns anymore to impose their will. And they didn't have enough butter for the bread that the um, Saudis and other uh, Arab states uh, aborning wanted to have buttered, and the United States had plenty of both. Yeah, in World War One, they had sent Lawrence of Arabia, who's glamorized, but they don't mention that they also sent him a lot of British Treasury gold. Yeah. So now it's true that the Soviets uh, did provide weapons and did have influence and were a counterbalance of uh, to some degree. Uh, in the 1950s up to 1972, when in one day, Anwar Sadat, president of Egypt, just expelled the thousands of, quote, advisors uh, and said, my advantage lies in uh, towards the West, not, not towards Moscow. Since then, until now, until the Chinese, that has been the case. It, there were hints of uh, flagging American uh, influence and interest. Two ways you could say uh, quickly. Um, President Obama um, never explicitly stated the following, but to me it was quite clear that in the the millennial uh, clash between the Sunni and the Shia, uh, the United States had, uh, since 1945, clearly sided with the Sunni because it was the Sunni who had the more oil, or at least with whom Franklin Roosevelt met uh, first. <laughs> right. Um, but as uh, energy becomes less significant and the world seemed to be less polarized, uh, Obama clearly was saying he doesn't really think the United States has a dog in the fight between the Sunni and the Shia and, and was trying to uh, balance relations so as to keep the Iranians from developing nuclear weapon. In 2015, uh, the Russians in the hideous civil war that was catalyzed by the American invasion of Iraq, um, the, the Russians intervened and the United States acquiesced because there was no happy solution. There was no solution to the, the chaos uh, in Syria that, barring a cost that the United States was unwilling to pay, since we had found um, Iraq to be uh, enough of a headache without taking on a second one, in the Middle East. <clears throat> and so both of those shifts, one in policy and the other in uh, acquiescence of Russian involvement, were signs of, of flagging American interests. But, but Xi's brokering of this peace agreement now brings the other true global power um, into the Middle East. And the United States can only applaud a peace agreement, uh, halting, imperfect, temporary as it may prove. It is a triumph. I think the most important thing is that going forward, uh, for the point Atul made, because uh, China is the principal trade partner of most countries, and, and including uh, in the Middle East, uh, and the principal uh, purchaser of oil, they will have the interest that the United States has believed it's had in maintaining the security of oil supplies uh, and uh, transit uh, tra uh, uh, shipping in the in the Persian Gulf. So that is truly, truly a significant event. What else? If does I may it do? very quickly Please. make that point that yeah. exactly what you said about uh, about um, Iran and Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. It applies to Solomon Islands. Solomon Islands are actually closer to Australia. And last year you said uh, a great line. You, you said that geography is destiny, but economics is also destiny. And basically the Solomon Islands went over to the Chinese because they were offering a bigger pot of gold. And the problem for the US now is that the new kid on the block, the new 800 pound gorilla, is there with its pot of gold for others to take. 
and that has been a part of the Belt and Road Initiative, that has been part of the um, Global Development Initiative, that is now supposedly part of the Global Security Initiative, and if that wasn't enough, they now have a Global Civilization Initiative too. I mean, if you read them, they're all jargon, communistic jargon, and, and, and actually, frankly, uh, bullshit. But... The point is that China is practicing real politic. People are not going uh, to China for all these GSI, GDI, GCI, BRI. They are going to China because A, uh, they are trading with China, and so they are selling to the Chinese. B, the Chinese are investing in their countries and economies. And C, the Chinese are giving them loans on favorable terms with no strings attached, or low, lower strings attached than, say, the IMF. The, the historic slogan that m most of you will know is that uh, trade follows the flag. That was uh, basically the imperial uh, perspective in the 19th century. But it's actually backwards. Um, it, it's the flag that follows trade, uh, meaning that uh, money talks uh, and uh, lack of conditions are uh, congenial. Uh, the United States uh, sets is... Um, Puritan, idealistic, and millennial. Uh, historically, we have a global mission, and we believe, uh, to bring democracy, truth, and justice in the American way everywhere. Because, of course, some Bedouin wants to live like somebody in Los Angeles. I mean, obviously. Um, well, some certainly do. I mean, certainly, so certainly, Mohammed bin Salman has taken that to heart. He has yachts, he even has a chateau in France. Right. Well, as our colleague I don't know Peter if he wants Isaacson to be in Los in Angeles Fondres. or in the Riviera. I think probably, but you know, showing better taste. But uh, yes, where was I? Uh, oh yes, the the, the Chinese uh, also um, come with easier terms they are less demanding which is a, a point a significant point in the shift that we're seeing and i'll get to in a moment uh, atul uh, spoke about the solomon islands this is the first security agreement that uh, china has signed in the uh, indo-pacific uh, region and the first one that exists other than an american-led alliance since 1945 uh, now, the Americans, the Australians, the New Zealanders, they all sent, uh, hastily sent envoys as soon as the agreement was signed between the Solomon Islands and China, uh, waiving cash and uh, issuing warnings about the perfidy of the Chinese, of course. But that's all to, you know, of, frankly, um, closing the barn door uh, after the horses have gotten out, or I should find some maritime metaphor, but you understand the point. Never again. Um, Hollering at uh, the ship after it has sailed out of the harbor. Absolutely, that's it. That, that's exactly it. Or come into the harbor, <laughs> as the case of the Chinese Navy, probably. Um, there, there's nothing uh, really the United States can do to to uh, change this dynamic because uh, the flag follows trade, and uh, the largest trading partner of the Solomon Islands is. China, uh, which is the case in uh, most countries of the world now. So you have, um, you can say it starkly, a, a breach of the American imperium in the Middle East. Um, at the same time that there's been a progressive redefinition, uh, reevaluation by the United States, <laughs> that the Middle East doesn't count so much anymore. Uh, a point that I would uh, actually agree with from the American perspective. I mean, uh, Obama the famously launched the Asia pivot policy, and his point was that the uh, dry sands, the barren sands of the Middle East had bled America dry. Both blood and treasure had been lost in Iraq. And, uh, and the big beast was now China, ipso facto. The U.S. had to shift to the Asia Pacific, that is why he came up with that uh, fantastic uh, uh, trade deal, fantastic from the point of view of American business, at least, and American imperial power, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific um, uh, Trade Deal. The cancellation of that by, by uh, then-President Trump is one of the historic blunders in American history. Um, perhaps more significant than the American invasion of Iraq, uh, both both being 
catastrophic uh, events or non-events um, for from the American perspective. So now we find um, the Middle East is no longer part of the American Imperium, really, uh, nor is the Pacific. Another uh, telling sign is from the security perspective. Of course, I think most of you will know that the Chinese Navy is literally larger now than the United States Navy, uh, not as um, uh, technically proficient uh, in, but in the catching number of boats, quickly. yes, Glenn, but they don't have the aircraft carriers, they don't have the nuclear submarines, they don't have the missiles, they don't have... Uh, uh, naval fighter jets taking off their aircraft However, carriers. So they, but they are achieving exactly what they set out to do. It's a very impressive strategic step-by-step um, -step approach. They want to remove American uh, military uh, power uh, and influence uh, from the Chinese littoral. And rather than com trying to compete at this point uh, with aircraft carriers, which may be... Uh, uh, the past era's technology, actually, uh, today, in the 21st century, uh, they have built uh, carrier-killing missiles, and they can build a thousand missiles for the cost that can kill a thousand carriers for the cost of one aircraft carrier. And they are so uh, And an aircraft carrier costs $5 billion. Uh, exactly. Isn't it? Roughly oh, I billion. think so. Yeah. I think so. Um that uh, now, during moments of uh, tension, and there are increasing uh, that increasingly defines the status quo, the air aircraft carrier task forces will only operate 1,500 kilometers from the Chinese coast, which is the range of a carrier busting missile. So, and earlier you would sail right up to the coast of China. Earlier, American ships which were, were basically merrily uh, coasting through the Taiwan Straits. That's that's literally the case. So those are two historic changes. She's visit to Moscow. <clears throat> Pardon my cough. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so of course, a lot of it is is uh, uh, kabuki. I guess that's the wrong culture. It's uh, Potemkin village diplomacy. You know, there's less than meets the eye. But on the other hand, uh, it's quite an astute and and significant move by Xi. By even, however flawed or or duplicitous, the the peace proposal that uh, she makes, he has made one, and that puts now the Ukrainians and the Western alliance uh, in the position of having to respond. One can now say, and to the casual observer from the global south, uh, for whom this does not seem to be particularly a relevant fight, uh, can say, well, look, there's a peace proposal on the table, and who is continuing to make war now? Now, that's a flawed, uh, a grievously wrong assessment, but it's a compelling one. It puts the United States on the uh, uh, back step, uh, back foot a little bit. It also shows, Xi's visit also shows his support to his eternal bosom buddy, Vladimir Putin, but at really low cost because the words of support are relatively thin. And the Chinese are being very careful not, at this point, to incur the headaches and the wrath of the United States by providing weapons. So, so the are Chinese bolstering... are working... Vladimir Putin, but not too much. So they want him to be strong, but not too strong. I think they they want him to bleed uh, American attention and resources, uh, and they don't mind that the Russians die to serve Beijing's ends at that point. Uh, you know, from that that's perspective, very similar to um, uh, that's very similar to Americans and Ukrainians. So in a way, Ukraine has Ukraine is the pawn for America to contain Russia, and Russia is the pawn for, uh, for China to contain America. So it's a, it's a fascinating geopolitical chess game. I, I'm not quite, I wouldn't characterize, and I'm sure you don't really either, um, as cynically exploitative the Western support for Ukraine as the Chinese, quote, support for uh, Russia. But, but, the, but the point is... No, is no, the Americans are Puritans. So, they are true believers. The Chinese are much more clear-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these things together um, have their regional um, major significance. But taken together, they indicate that... Um, now, what are, the, what are the Russian objectives in Ukraine? 
of course they are focused on Ukraine, but I think that actually is the secondary objective. Uh, Atul and I have written and spoken extensively, as as many others have, uh, on the the true motivations in the worldview of Vladimir Putin and and the great Russians. And in fact, the, in fact, the, uh, we are rather uh, pleased. Uh, we don't want to sound too. Uh, uh, to self-congratulatory, but we are rather pleased that uh, our article has been read by the top Russian experts in the U.S., and they have liked it. Um, our article from uh, December 24, 2021, um, which goes in great depth about uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, background, Russian recent Russian history, his motivations, the Russian resentment and paranoia. It's been read by top European experts, and they've liked it. Um, in fact, Peter Isaacson, our colleague, helped edit it. Um, it has also been liked by Russians, including people who served in Chechnya and, and served Putin loyally. So we are, we are rather uh, delighted that all the way from Indian diplomats to American spies uh, to Russians and, uh, and, and even the French, who are very difficult to please, have liked our piece. And so what is Putin um, seeking, really? It, 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 Ukraine, yes. But but deeper than that is he perceives an existential crisis, which is that as Ukraine turns to the West and repudiates um, Russian millennial civilization, uh, it threatens the uh, world that Putin believes should uh, obtain in, in Russia and Central Europe and the world, a major component of which is to... Um, reject and to undermine this normative world order that the United States has championed and uh, that has imperfectly but but really uh, obtained uh, since 1945 for much of the world. Um, he's, Putin's clear objective is to destroy that in Central Europe, but also globally. That is also the explicit objective of Xi Jinping. He wants China to be um, not just a player, but the arbiter of, of norms. That is not uh, surprising. Any power seeks to make decisions rather than to, to uh, cede them to somebody else to make. Uh, but the kind of decisions, the framework that he seeks to create is a sphere of influence. It's very seductive to the global south because he doesn't, the Chinese approach and the Russian approach, is not to say, well, you have to have labor laws before we will sell you um, cars. And you have to uh, uh, let women do whatever they want. Whatever these these cultural, um, environmental, labor, human rights standards are that the United States and the West um, try to impose, the Chinese yeah, and the Russians don't note, care about very it. Very quickly, the, the uh, norms of the West are universalist. They believe that there are universal human rights and um, countries, all countries should adhere to them. They believe that there are environmental standards that everyone should adhere to. They believe that there are certain labor rights uh, that should be universal. Uh, I would say just not should, must. Must be, exactly. But the challenge with uh, such uh, principles is quite often people's interests or the interests of the states run contrary to those principles. And then the West is quite justifiably accused of hypocrisy. And so when, when everyone um, uh, goes and looks at Ukraine and, and talks about Russian aggression, uh, a lot of the Russians, Chinese and members of the Global South very conveniently and importantly point out that the U.S. invaded Iraq. So what's the difference? And so this is a tricky situation for the West to be in. And the imperial record doesn't help either. Remember, India was conquered by the British East India Company and uh, the former colonies all the way from French colonies such as Algeria to former Spanish colonies in South America to uh, an American American colony like Philippines, they are still struggling with the aftermath. They haven't quite recovered from that experience of colonization. So these are three significant events in and of themselves. 
with regional and global implications. But taken together, and I don't, so I don't go on too long because I'm, I'm a little past my target. I'll just take probably two minutes. What is the what are the consequences? The result of these three indicate these three examples of uh, of the global change. It's, these aren't just new events that have changed elements on the ground. This is a historic shift going forward. The U.S. post-war normative system has been breached uh, and broken. It exists now within the Western uh, bloc. Uh, there are now two clearly competing systems with a floating, you can't call a, something amorphous and disorgan unorganized, um, a bloc, but that's the simple term, of the global south that um, I would argue most countries almost all of them in the global south um, would uh, do benefit and and would uh, choose the normative order because of the benefits that it it uh, long term and the macro sense will convey but uh, they can be free riders and they can benefit from the uh, the advantages offered by the much more transactional sphere of influence block while uh, resisting falling under its control, if not its sway from time to time. So you have a sphere of influence system now, a normative system now, they're clearly defined and no longer is there even lip service paid to uh, the global uh, reality or uh, objective of the normative system. And you have much more empowered, independent, um, cynical, but that's sort of normal, um, uh, Southern uh, actors who uh, will um, profit from both sides uh, at relatively low cost to themselves until a, a major crisis uh, um, arises and they find that the sphere of influence system doesn't serve their interest and then they'll be stuck, say, with Tibet or Kashmir or... Um, um, the Kurds, or I don't know, uh, the, the Georgians, and so on. The Georgians are ardently trying to be parts of, of the Western system. So what implications does that have for all of us, uh, other than this global framework? I think we're going to see, we already are seeing um, shockingly strong uh, indications of increasing industrial policy by uh, the Western nations. This is a repudiation of uh, 75 years of uh, the decline of uh, uh, industrial policy viewed as too, too statist. Uh, you'll see, I'm pretty confident, increased uh, defense budgets by uh, the United States. We've heard about this as, uh, in Europe as response to the Russian invasion. We've already seen increased protectionism, uh, a rise of progressively, truly stark economic blocks uh, there, there it won't be a stop to trade between China and the, United, and the West, of course. But uh, just looking at the computer chips, for example, um, uh, social media, we will see progressive um, bifurcation of the system, uh, uh, system of, of the globe. Um, I think that the consequences of that overall are relatively slower rates of economic growth over a long period of time. Uh, but particularly so in the sphere of interest block, because uh, the statist approach uh, does lead to, to less efficient and slower growth over time. And then, of course, we all are concerned, and we should be, about the increasing risks of military clash in the South China Sea and Taiwan, uh, along the Indian-Chinese border, uh, many different places. And then the global south, as I said, is freer to act uh, uh, going forward. And um, it will be perhaps the net winner for at least the medium term in this because they can benefit from both sides. And I'll stop with there. But but I think we have lived uh, a phase in the last 12 months as significant as 1945. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I'd agree completely with you um, on the point that we are seeing a completely new era dawn and this era is more multipolar uh, this era will be obviously one of spheres of influence and this era will will also be one wherein the normative order itself will be challenged and i think one of the challenges that um, international relations theory forgets 
uh, when it comes up with all these ideas, uh, realist, structuralist, uh, all kinds of is isms, is that um, a lot of what we call the global south, the nation state per se is very different to the nation state of Europe. It is not a cohesive act. And in fact, we are seeing that the nation states, even of the West, are not cohesive. Um, very quickly, take two data points. Uh, we had a huge controversy on the walk side in America about a transgender swimmer who was breaking all women's records. We have an article by Dr. Jennifer Wider on it, and which raises all the key issues. And that uh, Vogue crowd has been up in arms and has been very demanding and has been uh, uh, claiming universality of its ideology, which horrifies more traditional societies across the world and horrifies traditionalists in the US. And recently, we had the other side of the spectrum, parents complaining about students being shown Michelangelo's naked David and, and, and leading to the resignation of the head teacher. Uh, between the two spectrums, uh, these are societies in tumult themselves. So when we talk about the normative order, what are the norms of that order? Because the US cannot simultaneously champion free trade and have an industrial policy, which now it has when it comes to semiconductors. And uh, also it's Inflation Reduction Act, which is basically protectionist and discriminates against even European industry. Uh, in fact, Alex Gloy, our um, author on economics, was telling us how German companies are finding it hard to bid for wind farms um, here in northeastern United States. So the challenge with the normative order is that the norms themselves upheld in 1945 by a dominant and victorious United States of America, led uh, by Truman, Churchill had just died, uh, are no longer upheld. Roosevelt, uh, after the war, I'm talking. Oh, no, no, Roosevelt had just died. My apologies. Yeah, Roosevelt had just died, and, uh, and, and of course, Truman had taken over. Uh, and that, that order uh, is at threat at home. In fact, uh, none other than John Bolton said he would like to blow 10 floors of the United Nations or something. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't refer to Bolton as a, a reference worthy of citation. Uh, please. Um, I, I, gee, this is a vast subject. I, I just, I'll make two quick uh, points and then, and then I, I want to turn it over to our banking uh, yeah, uh, perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, there are such similarities in the the uh, moment we are living uh, to the 1930s, uh, and I mentioned I would, that. There, that's where we'll disagree. I would say I, I see similarities uh, in uh, with the 1900s and 1910s. I see more similarities with the pre World War One period. But crack on, you say your piece, please. I think the it, it's a standard um, perception by a non. Uh, American uh, observers <clears throat> to be appalled by and view as decadent and disaggregating the um, the cultural chaos and conflicts uh, in the United States. And uh, I don't invariably, think it's decadent at all. His, For me, it is not decadent at all. His, historically, um, that's proven to be wrong. And 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 I have been. Fascinated as I, I've been reading a lot about the uh, 30s for reasons um, which I, I will skip for the moment. Um, that uh, the chaos that that uh, certainly occupies my mind uh, that we're living now and and the clashes in the United States are really um, no different uh, and arguably less uh, less severe than what has always been the case in American society. Um, the greatest generation was was uh, roiled with conflict and, in, uh, and clash and disagreement. Uh, and I think that the very no name greatest generation is profoundly misleading. In any event, uh, I'm less pessimistic in some ways from this cultural perspective than, than many, many are. Join the conversation at Fair Observer and subscribe to our YouTube channel.